Let me ask you a question. What is Vladimir Putin's ideology? Is he left wing or right wing? In today's video, we're gonna review this and many other crucial elements for understanding this man. And I know what many of you are thinking. Another video about Putin? We've been hearing about this man's barbarities all year. What else can be said about Putin that we don't already know? Let's be clear, from an ethical point of view, Putin deserves all possible anti-awards and condemnations. Now, until a few months ago, all analysts recognized his strategic vision. He might be bad, but he was no fool. As it stands, after all the mistakes he has made in Ukraine, it is not so clear that he is in fact an evil genius that some might have thought. That's why in today's video, we're gonna focus on Putin's biography. Who is Vladimir Putin? What political legacy does he hope to leave behind? To what extent does his life experience influence his political ideology? Today, we're gonna answer all of these questions, but first, let's look at some history. From KGB to Moscow Sky. Since he came to power, Vladimir Putin has wanted to make himself look like a strong man, capable in the collective imagination of even hunting a tiger with his bare hands, or of subduing a bear in a fight to the death. But what if I told you that the former KGB agent was not as important and imposing as he is today? The reality, visual politic viewers, is that he was far from being any kind of Russian James Bond. In reality, he was more like a civil servant in an office pushing papers, quite the opposite of the classic messianic politician we have come to know since. Putin was born in the year 1952 in the most liberal city of the entire former Soviet Union. Union, Leningrad, what is now St. Petersburg. Unlike Zelensky, Putin grew up in a working class family, and here comes one of the great key factors to his life. His father was a die-hard communist, and his mother a fervent Orthodox Christian. So religious was this woman that she decided to baptize her son in secret, even without his father's knowledge. That is, his soul has been divided since his childhood, and this has marked Putin's ideology to this day. In fact, pay attention to one of his most remembered quotes. Anyone who doesn't regret the passing of the Soviet Union has no heart. Anyone who wants it restored has no brains. Vladimir Putin, 20th of February, 2000. However, during his youth, Putin was a patriot of the Soviet Union. That's why, as soon as he finished his studies in 1975, he joined the KGB. For those who don't know the KGB, it was the Soviet Intelligence Agency, the equivalent of the CIA. This is where the myth of Putin as a hero of the nation committed to his countrymen and mother Russia usually starts. <laughs> I'm sure many of you have heard that Putin was very important in the Soviet intelligence service, and we have all at some point imagined a sort of communist James Bond. But the reality is rather less spectacular. In reality, most of a spy's work is office work. In fact, Putin was mainly in charge of recruiting informants. He was posted to the offices in East Germany, at the time a colony of the USSR. Living in East Berlin, Putin experienced one of the most significant events in recent history, something that forced him to rethink his communist convictions. In 1989, the Germans tore down the Berlin Wall. Three years later, Putin returned to his hometown just as the Soviet Union president, Mikhail Gorbachev, announced the end of communism. As you can imagine, all of this came as a shock to the values Putin had upheld for years in the KGB. That explains why he resigned from his post and went into politics. He started advising the first democratically elected mayor of St. Petersburg. His first job was to find international investors for the city. Putin's rise to power actually precisely began here, by managing to keep the oligarchs on a tight leash. And so, in 1998, he took over the Federal Security Service, the former KGB. By that time, he was already a political party figurehead. However, the second ideological shock came in 1998. What happened that year? It was when Putin lost his mother. If you remember, Putin's mother was a fervent Christian. Well, on her deathbed, she gave him a crucifix. And from what his biographers say, since then, he has never taken it off. This was the moment when Putin renewed his faith. And believe me, this is something much more significant than it seems. But we'll get to that later. In 1999, with his faith renewed, Yeltsin was already paving the way for Putin's seizure of power. And earlier that year, appointed him prime minister and later acting president. <laughs> After Yeltsin resigned and elections were called, Putin became the absolute president of Russia. He won the 2000 election with more than 50% of the vote. Yeltsin had given the people a new leader to follow. But you may be wondering, how did a guy like Putin, who many people, even within the country, feared, come to power? This is explained by two simple reasons. The promise of a better economy after the 1998 crisis and his firmness in the face of Chechen terrorism. Remember that Chechnya is a turbulent territory for Russia with aspirations of independence that ended in a harsh military confrontation with Moscow. Putin was going to be the strong and determined man that Russia wanted. Putin promised an air of renewal in the country, but he was aware that a large part of the population missed the Soviet Union. Therefore, measures such as restoring the USSR anthem as the national anthem with some changes in the lyrics or using the Soviet Union flag for military events are not surprising. Now do you understand why Russian tanks with Soviet flags are seen in Ukraine? But beyond all the symbolism, what has Putin really done? What exactly does this man believe in?
Capitalism à la Poutine. If you remember, Putin was stationed in communist Germany with the KGB until the Berlin Wall fell. He experienced firsthand the inefficiencies of the Soviet administration, corrupt officials, untalented people coming to power for political favors, and a spiral of mistakes that led to the final collapse of the regime. Since then, it has become clear to Putin that communism does not work. Communism and Soviet power did not make Russia a prosperous country with a dynamically developing society and a free people. Russian political statement at the turn of the century, Vladimir Putin. With Putin, it was clear that there would be no return to communism. But of course, the system he had inherited from Yeltsin was not very efficient either. So what do you think he did? If you are loyal followers of visual politics, you've surely guessed it. Putin style capitalism. And how did he build it? By using some old acquaintances of the channel. The Siloviki. If you remember, the Siloviki are politicians and senior government officials with long careers for the country's security services. For example, Sergei Ivanov and Sergei Shogu were former colleagues, and here I want us to make an interesting consideration. For Putin, the problem with communism was not the centralized economy, but the bad managers. When Yeltsin attempted his transition to capitalism, he surrounded himself with poorly educated oligarchs who came, in many cases, with addictions of all kinds. That is why Putin's big gamble was to replace the bad managers with people with strong ideas, a firm hand, and a good resume. This is the basic principle of Siloviki capitalism. And you will ask, but did Putin-style capitalism work? Well, in theory, it would kind of seem so. Look at this graph. Since Putin came to power in 2000, the Russian economy grew without interruption until 2008. In fact, Russian wages even doubled. I'm sure most of you know why. That's right, Russia is an energy powerhouse. At a time when gas and oil prices were high, Russia experienced a real honeymoon. The economy was going from strength to strength and managed to settle all state accounts. In any case, time seemed to prove Putin right. His economic formula was not based on creating strong institutions, but on putting good managers in decision-making positions. And you will say, is that it? Is that all we can say about Putin's ideology? No, it's not. There is much more, and we're going to get into that now. Europe and Asia united? It is clear that in order to understand Putin, you don't have to read Marx, nor Hayek, nor Adam Smith. Putin's great intellectual references are Russian authors practically unknown in the West. Authors such as Ivan Ilyin, Yegveni Primikov, and Alexander Dugin. And this brings us to an ideology that very likely few of you have heard of, Eurasianism. Basically, Eurasianism advocates for the creation of a cultural bloc between Europe and Asia in opposition to what would be an Anglo-American bloc. Of course, all this can be translated into one phrase, re-establishing the Russian colonial empire. But for Eurasians, all of this has a much deeper justification. So how does this translate into policy? Let's take a look. Putin is following a sort of updated version of the five points that 1993 Russian Prime Minister Yevgeny Primakov followed. The first is the defense of Russia's position as a world power and not just a regional one. The second is what is known as rational pragmatism. Third, the partnership with China is the cornerstone of Russian foreign policy. The fourth is opposition to any NATO expansion and closer ties with those countries that want to fight against US dominance. And the fifth, that Russia use its nuclear might and veto power in the UN Security Council. In fact, the updated version, Alexander Dugin's Neo-Eurasianism, sees three specific countries that could help Russia to leave the Eurasian project. Germany to control Europe, Iran to strengthen ties with the Arab countries, and Japan to control Asia. Since Dugin does not trust much in China's future imperialist pretensions either, this is the theory. And you might be wondering, why does Putin want to form a Eurasian bloc? Well, if you remember, Neo-Eurasianism wants to wrest the world's polis from the clutches of Uncle Sam. Put another way, Putin advocates a multipolar world order as opposed to the undisputed dominance of the United States. And what would those poles be? Eurasia? under Russian command, of course, China and the United States, Putin puts the essence of Eurasianism, which can be summarized as follows. Russia should regain great power status and should become a center of opposition to American unilateralism in world politics. Emery Erson, PhD at Mamara University, 2004. So how can Russia regain this status? Of course, one of the pillars is a strong military. This explains the modernization of the army that took place in the 2010s. <laughs> only that. To become a hegemonic power, Russia needed soft power. And that brings us to the Karaganov Doctrine. This movie-like term is one of Putin's main tools for justifying his invasions. It's very simple. To make Russia the protector of all ethnically Russian people living in the surrounding countries, even if they have another nationality. This may involve giving Russian passports to the populations of territories within other countries. And in that way, you can then justify an intervention of the army. In theory, they're defending their compatriots. That is why it is also known as compatriot politics. But is Putin the perfect Eurasian leader. 
Far from it. In politics, theory is one thing and practice is another. For example, during the Afghan war, Putin allowed the United States to establish military bases in Central Asia. This earned him all kinds of criticism among hardline Eurasianists. However, while he may not be the perfect Eurasian leader, he is really the only one in the region right now. His goal remains the same, for the United States not to have so much power and for Russia to restore its honor. But to do this, he needs more than just weakening Uncle Sam. He needs to create a Eurasian identity. So how does Putin hope to do this? Well, like this. In Putin, we trust. Do you remember that Putin reaffirmed his orthodox faith upon the death of his mother? Well, this is not just an anecdote. Putin's coming to power brought a radical change in the way religion was treated in Russia. In fact, the main pillar for Eurasian identity is none other than the Orthodox Church. Stop and think for a moment. The Soviet Union was an atheistic state. Religion was persecuted, including Orthodox Christianity. However, even though the Soviet Union crushed religion on its territory, they did not kill the faith. In fact, today, more than 70% of the population in Russia is Orthodox Christian. That is why the Orthodox Church is a key figure in the Eurasian project. At the end of the day, if you want to invade countries, you need more than weapons. You also need to build a national identity. And for that, religion is fundamental. But how does all of this translate into actual policies? One of Putin's first policies was to lower taxes on the Orthodox Church. In Russia, churches are not exempt from paying taxes. What's more, in 2010, the Kremlin returned all the property that the communists had seized from the religions. But that's not all. Putin has allowed the church to make huge profits from energy companies. All of this has meant a huge capital injection for the Orthodox popes. Thanks to that, they have been able to build more than 23 thousand new churches. In other words, while the rest of Europe is becoming increasingly secular, Russia is going the opposite direction. But we're not just talking about money. We are also talking about culture. For example, in 2012, he introduced the subject of orthodoxy in all public schools. And in 2016, he introduced the Yarovava law, which allows the state to repress minority religious communities such as Protestants from evangelizing Russians. So what did the Orthodox Church give him in return? You guessed it. Unconditional support in all Russian expansion campaigns. In 2014, when when Russia supported secessionists in the eastern part of Ukraine, in the Donbass, the church served as a massive propaganda apparatus. In all Orthodox churches, the interests of the Kremlin were defended. And this loyalty continues to this day. Check this out. Patriarch Kirill calls on Russians to spiritual mobilization. EFE Agency, 27 September 2022. In fact, the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church has gone so far as to say that the war would purify the soul of anyone who fell in combat. Check this out. The church is aware that if someone dies in the line of military duty, then undoubtedly he sacrifices himself for others. This sacrifice washes away all the sins that a person has committed. Patriarch Kirill. So the question is, to what extent is Putin achieving his Eurasian dream? Well, we have to acknowledge that, until this year, 2022, he was taking significant strides in this direction. For example, in 2014, he finalized one of the key projects of Eurasianism, the Eurasian Economic Union. The union brings together only five countries, Russia, of course, along with Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Armenia. Last year, we dedicated an entire video to this union, which could be Russia's version of the European Union. Freedom of people, capital, and goods between these five countries. So what is the problem? The problem is that the war in Ukraine has called all of this into question. One of the most important countries with this union is Kazakhstan, which is moving further and further away from Russian orbit. We've talked about this at length in other videos, which we'll link in the description. But right now, the questions are over to you. Will the Ukrainian war be a definitive blow to Putin's Eurasian project? And if you were to win the war, would this be a boost? Wouldn't his Eurasian partners fear Mother Russia if they disagreed with Putin? You can leave us your answers in the comments below. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Politic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like like it so we know. All the best, and I'll see you next time.